Hi and welcome everyone uh, to the first seminar of 2023 and a happy new year. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Emily Dennis as our speaker. Uh, em Emily is my former lab mate uh, from a while ago uh, when she was a grad student and, and I was a postdoc. And it's nice to see her come back and, and present. Uh, Emily got her uh, PhD in neuroscience from UCLA under the mentorship of Paul Thompson. She then completed a postdoc at USC and at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard. Uh, since then, she got recruited to the University of Utah, where she's now an assistant professor of neurology. So work focuses on the effects of TBI on brain structure and function, and particularly on understanding the sources of variability in, in post-injury outcome. So, so Emily co-leads uh, with, with David Tate and uh, Elizabeth Wilde, uh, the Brain Injury Working Group of the Enigma Consortium. So Enigma, as most of you know, stands for Enhancing Neuroimaging Genetics through Meta-Analysis. And now it's a huge collaborative network, uh, including 2,000 plus uh, researchers across the globe. And the idea is to pool and create a large sample size or, or large sample sizes for subpopulations uh, to identify genetic influences on the brain. So, so the Enigma Brain Injury Working Group that, that Emily co-leads uh, itself has over 220 researchers from 96 institutions across 16 countries involved across 10 different subgroups. And, and these subgroups are either focused on specific patient populations, uh, military, sports, pediatric, uh, TBI, or, or methods development. So resting state, uh, ASL, MRS, and so on. So, so I, I, don't, I don't know how, how you, you manage, manage all, all these things. Uh, so, so Emily is also the co-PI of the Imaging Biomarker Core. Uh, for care for kids, uh, and if I understand, care for kids is an NIH uh, multi-site project and has a site here also at UCLA. In the principal site, yeah. Cool, uh, and 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 she's also a member of the Limbic uh, CENC project, uh, another consortium. Uh, I think funded by the DoD, uh, which is studying the long-term effects uh, of of combat-related mild TBI. Uh, and lastly, she is the the director of Enigma U. Uh, which is different from the Enigma Genetics project I mentioned before. Uh, Enigma U is an online school with a neuroscience curriculum aimed at high school seniors and college freshmen uh, and was created to address inequality in the field of neurosciences, uh, uh, which, which, is, which is great. Uh, so, so Emily today uh, is going to talk to us about cerebellar alterations after pediatric TBI and how she uses uh, multimodal approaches for, for the parcellation and, and measuring the key aspects of the, of the cerebellum. Uh, so let's welcome Emily. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the invite. I always love uh, coming back to UCLA in whatever capacity. <laughs> um, so thank you for the, for the invite. And as you heard with all of the consortia that I'm involved with, there's tons and tons of collaboration. So everything that you ever see me present is uh, a extremely joint effort. So, um, so yes, today I'm going to talk about cerebellar alterations after pediatric brain injury. Um, so just briefly the cerebellum um, and what we know about function. So lesion studies in the early 19th century established that the cerebellum has a critical role in motor coordination. Um, but for the most part, um, understanding just kind of stopped there for a while. And it wasn't until the 1970s that it was proposed that there might also be non-motor functions of the cerebellum. Um, and this is still um, a hot topic of uh, research today. So uh, main divisions of the cerebellum, uh, we have an anterior lobe here in red, the posterior lobe in pink, the flocculonodular lobe here in the center, and the vermis, which runs down the midline. And we'll go into a little bit more detail on, on those um, in the next slides. So um, going into non-motor cerebellum functions, um, this was a very nice paper a few years ago where they had participants perform a large number of cognitive, um, cognitive, cognitive tests to try to map how the cerebellum is involved in um, different cognitive functions. And as you can see, broken down here, we've got, of course, some expected um, motor areas in the anterior lobe, but there's this complicated mosaic across uh, the posterior lobe where um, cerebellum contributes to motor planning, to language function, attention. So it's, it's clearly more complicated than just um, balance and coordination. Um, and that's one reason why we wanted to look at it in traumatic brain injury. 
So the cerebellum has actually been relatively understudied in traumatic brain injury. Um, in terms of neuroimaging papers in humans, there aren't very many. And two potential reasons, and I'm sure there are several more, but two potential reasons for this. Um, one of them is true and one is a misconception. Um, what is true is that the injury-related displacements are lowest in the cerebellum. So we're less likely to see primary or direct injury there. And the one that is a misconception is that it was initially thought that the cerebellum matured early and was thus less vulnerable to insult. Um, but as I'll show on the next slides, that's actually not the case. So, okay, injury-related displacements are lowest in the cerebellum, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at it. We know that disruption can spread from an initial injury epicenter to other parts of the brain, um, possibly due to structural and functional connectivity. And work in animals has shown um, particular uh, selective loss of Purkinje cells as a secondary um, effect of injury elsewhere in the brain. What has been shown in humans um, is smaller cerebellum volume in pediatric moderate to severe TBI, as well as lower fractional anisotropy, so disrupted white matter organization. And then in adults, um, a study using SPECT found evidence for frontocerebellar dissociation, um, another point suggesting that there is um, uh, some reason for the disconnect, uh, the, the connection between the cerebellum is some reason for the disruptions that we might see in the cerebellum, and uh, with ASL hypoperfusion in cerebellum um, in adult TBI, um, severity was not specified in that one. So this led us to a few hypotheses in our analyses. Um, we uh, hypothesize that cerebellar disruptions are secondary effects and will thus emerge at later time points post-injury, that we will not see them in the early stages of injury. Uh, further, we hypothesize that these disruptions would be associated with cognitive, cognitive dysfunction and that white matter disruptions early on will be predictive of later cerebellum disruptions. This was our hypothesis based on what's been shown in the past and the um, possibility that it's the connectivity of the cerebellum um, with other, other regions of the brain that might be primary targets of injury that is the reason for the uh, vulnerability of the cerebellum later on. So as we're talking about connectivity of the cerebellum, I um, wanted to show these slides. Uh, the cerebellum is um, very connected, very interconnected with the cerebrum, both structurally and functionally. So the cerebellum um, receives inputs from many areas of the cortex um, through the peduncles, through the middle peduncle. And it also sends many um, projections out, originating in the deep nuclei, out to many areas of the cerebrum. Uh, looking at functional connectivity, we can also see that the cerebellum is involved in a lot of the main resting state networks that people examine. So here with the default mode network, we see cerebellar uh, correlations and activity. And with the executive control network, um, here with the dorsal attention network and also with the salience network. So it's clearly tightly involved in a lot of the higher level functions that we um, that we typically examine when we when we think about the, the cerebrum and the cortex and not just a motor coordination area. Um, the development of the cerebellum. So it was initially thought that this was, as it was a primitive area that only did motor functions, that it must mature early on. Um, but this is not the case. And just like the rest of the brain, there is a um, an array of developmental trajectories, um, uh, regional developmental trajectories across the cerebellum. So vermal regions, that's the midline, and lobule 9 uh, are the earliest to mature. They peak before or around age 5. The anterior lobe, which is lobules 1 through 5, peaks uh, by about 12 to 16 years. The posterior lobe, which is the, the largest part, um, with, which is lobules uh, 6 through 8b, that's including CRIS1 and CRIS2. Those, uh, those peak in adolescence and up into early adulthood. And the flocular nodular lobe, which is also called lobule 10, it's this dark green one here, um, peaks around age 30. So uh, definitely an extended maturational period that varies across the cerebellum, just like the cerebrum. <laughs> 
So um, Shantanu already gave a wonderful overview of the Enigma Consortium, and um, I know that um, a lot of you are familiar with it because it started at UCLA, um, but it has, um, it has grown quite a bit since those beginnings. There are now over 2,000 researchers around the world who are involved, um, and it's, um, I think, a wonderful way to identify, to answer some questions. Um, it's certainly not the answer to all of this, and there are a lot of questions that we can't answer with the Enigma approach. Um, but a lot that we can. So I lead the uh, brain injury working group. And within that today, we're going to focus on the pediatric uh, moderate to severe TBI working group. Um, just a little bit um, about methods and how we were looking at cerebellum volume. Um, so this is a method that was released recently called Acapulco Automatic Cerebellum Anatomical Parcellation Using UNET with Locally Constrained Optimization, um, developed by Han et al. And this was developed by uh, Han is, uh, et al. They're not part of Enigma, but this uh, workflow was adapted for Enigma uh, by the Ataxia Working Group led by Ian Harding. And this is an important thing to keep in mind because a lot of the um, neuroimaging processing tools that we use are developed and tested on healthy brains. And um, this is not the case in traumatic brain injury. And so some of them can fail pretty spectacularly when you throw lesions uh, into the mix. So knowing that this was um, adapted for broader use by a group that is, has experience working with atrophy and, and not typical healthy brains, um, gave us confidence that this would be uh, an acceptable approach for our studies. So the Pediatric Moderate to Severe uh, TBI Working Group, and a lot of the kind of nitty gritty of the work that I'm showing today was done by my wonderful RA Finn. Um, so we have 12 cohorts from around the world who contributed to this analysis. The severity, the name of the, the group is moderate to severe TBI, but um, in actuality, there's also complicated mild through severe. So complicated mild is mild, meaning a um, GCS, a Glasgow coma scale of 13 and above, but with injury related imaging abnormalities. So we clustered our participants based on, this is the, the standard um, breakdown of severity for GCS, where lower GCS indicates more severe injury. We also broke our participants into three post-injury intervals. And what I'm gonna show are our definitions. They're informed by what, what others have published and what we know about the neuropathology and how it changes over time and, and the designs of our cohorts, but these should not um, be taken as the gold standard necessarily. So we have an acute uh, or subacute stage, which is individuals who have their imaging within seven weeks of their injury. And at this stage, acute pathology and swelling are dominating. Um, post-acute, individuals who are two to six months post-injury, at this point, secondary injuries um, become more apparent and chronic, which is individuals who are six months or more post-injury. And at this stage, there is still some recovery or degeneration going on, but the brain becomes more stable. So this is an important thing to keep in mind in all traumatic brain injury research because um, you can't just blindly include somebody who's a week post-injury with somebody who's a year post-injury. Your interpretations of the uh, of any effects that you find um, are going to be informed by the underlying pathology and that's gonna be different over this course. So um, one last point about our um, our cohorts is that there are two separate um, comparison populations that they uh, used. So some participants, um, there's some cohorts included healthy control participants, while others included orthopedic injury controls or OI controls. These are people who had an extra, um, uh, who had an injury that did not involve the brain, broke a leg, something like that. And the reason that a lot of, um, especially pediatric studies will include um, OI controls is that ADHD is a risk factor for injury in general. Um, and it, of course, is associated with its own pattern of changes in the brain. So including OI controls um, can, can control for, for this um, predisposition so that you can look at actual injury effects. These are the cohorts that were um, involved in our study. Um, so a grand total of 598 participants. Some of these studies are longitudinal. 
um, as you can see here. Uh, and so we used all of the data that we possibly could at, at any given stage. So we had a grand total of 783 scans across these. Uh, these asterisks uh, here denotes uh, sites that used OI controls as opposed to healthy controls. And UT Houston um, had both OI and healthy controls in their study. Um, on to the processing. So as I mentioned, we processed our data through Acapulco. Um, all of those sites shared their raw T1 scans with us. So we were able to do all of the processing locally and all of the QC locally. Um, the volumes of 28 separate ROIs were extracted using Acapulco. Um, the ones that were left, right lateralized were just averaged. Um, so we had a total of 18 that we examined. We conducted a uh, visual QC to find errors like this right here. This was um, definitely the most common error that we found uh, under inclusion of 8A and 8B. And we um, removed outliers uh, defined as three standard deviations. Uh, we also reviewed all of the scans for cerebellar lesions and these were relatively rare. There were only about 14% of our TBI population that had cerebellar lesions that were visible on a T1 scan. We ran this as a mixed effects model, uh, it was a mega analysis. So cohort and subject were uh, nested random effects for, the for those models that used longitudinal data. And for multiple comparisons correction, um, a traditional Bonferroni approach is, is too strict in this case for these 18 separate ROIs because they're not totally independent. They, they will um, be correlated with each other. So we have used this method, method across a few Enigma analyses now, uh, the Li and G method of essentially scaling your, um, your Bonferroni approach by the correlations in your data. So based on that, um, what was 18 separate uh, analyses effectively became 11 based on the correlation structure. So our threshold for significance was 0 0.0045. Um, this is a, a big confusing <laughs> page and a, uh, a, an image that Finn spends a lot of time putting together, but we're going to walk through um, and highlight pieces of it. Um, just starting with our primary group comparison um, for this TBI versus control, um, all of the subjects that we could include, so site and subject as random effects, with age, sex, and intracranial volume as uh, covariates. Um, we then did secondary analyses, um, accounting for potential confounds. So uh, what was the control population type if the site excluded uh, participants with ADHD? Um, if the site, uh, uh, excuse me, if we excluding subjects who had visible cerebellar lesions. We then broke it down by chronicity and severity. So looking at complicated mild TBI only, moderate and severe and in each of the separate phases uh, separately. And then within the TBI group, we examined associations with one executive functioning measure, the brief. This was the, um, the main one that was common across our sites, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. In our longitudinal analyses, these, uh, we, for the cerebellum, we only looked at total cerebellum volume. And uh, covariates here were interval and the time since injury for the first scan. Uh, we also examined potential confounds such as um, uh, severity, uh, global changes in brain volume and cerebellar lesions. And then finally, our exploratory multimodal analyses. We ran these cross-sectionally and longitudinally. And the question we were trying to answer here, it was, um, are, are white matter measures associated with cerebellum volume? Um, and further, could they be predictive of changes in cerebellum volume? Um, just briefly, I know everyone here is familiar with diffusion tensor imaging. We used the um, Enigma DTI processing pipeline, which uh, includes TBSS skeletonization and then averaging measures within the set of JHU ROIs. Most of those ROIs are shown here, um, but we also included the peduncles for obvious reasons. For this analysis, um, we only looked at FA, um, fractional anisotropy, which is a measure, measure of white matter organization. 
And now on to our, our uh, results. So for our primary group comparison, we found significantly smaller total cerebellum volume in the TBI group with a um, kind of moderate to small, moderate effect size here. Um, this was primarily driven by changes in the posterior lobe and the, and the vermis. So here in the posterior lobe, we see several regions where we see smaller volumes in the TBI group and also in the vermis. We see nothing that survives correction for multiple comparisons in the anterior lobe or the flocculonodular lobe. And these are displayed here on the flat map. Um, looking at potential confounds, when we um, looked for differences in results based on a control uh, patient population, um, we did see significant results. Um, the results were, as we would expect, more prominent when compared to healthy controls. However, a lot of the orthopedic injury control sites did not exclude patients with pre-existing ADHD. And so when we ran this analysis, um, only including sites that had excluded for ADHD, the results were similar. So this tells us uh, we know that ADHD has associations with cerebellum volume, um, but when we see significant results, um, when we compare to healthy controls and orthopedic injury controls, that tells us that our results are not simply um, general effects of the stresses of injury, that they are specific to traumatic brain injury. And also um, when we excluded participants who had visible cerebellar lesions, our results were consistent. Now tiling this out by chronicity and severity. Uh, in this image here, I am showing uh, effect sizes for, for everything that was above zero, um, but many of these were not significant. So all of the not significant ones are at 50% opacity and the significant ones are um, at high intensity and, and outlined by blue here. So uh, we see, and as, as expected, we, we see an association with uh, severity, where in the most severe injury, we see the greatest effect sizes. Um, we also see an association with chronicity, though, where in there, there's a few um, significant results in the acute phase and the post-acute phase, but um, our results are most prominent and most widespread in the chronic phase. So this... Uh, to us is evidence that this is not um, an effect of di direct or primary injury. This include, um, paired with the fact that we don't see differences when we exclude participants with lesions in the cerebellum um, and that there weren't that many participants who had lesions in the cerebellum. So this supports our hypothesis that this is a secondary effect of injury. Um, executive function. So our, um, most of our sites collected the brief, the behavioral rating inventory of executive function. Um, this was a parent report of executive function problems. We used the global executive composite, which is an overarching summary of executive function. And what we see here is within the TBI group, smaller total cerebellum volume was associated with more parent reported problems. Um, this, for this analysis, we only looked at brief. We were limited to the measures that were common um, across our cohorts and brief was by far the one that was collected by the most, most cohorts. And we're doing some work right now to try to establish crosswalks uh, across scales within a given domain so that in the future we can do uh, domain level analyses of other um, executive, uh, of other cognitive functions without being limited by exact overlap in scales. Um, moving on to our longitudinal analyses. So these uh, sample sizes, of course, got quite a bit smaller because participants needed to have high quality segmentations at both time one and time two. Um, and we removed uh, three outliers. So we had a total of 72 participants who had um, appropriate data for this analysis. And what we see overall is less growth in the cerebellum volume uh, in the TBI group. This is total cerebellum volume. And we have the non-TBI group in pink and the TBI group in blue. Within the TBI group, there is some variability where some participants are showing uh, decreases in brain volume and some are showing increases. They're just uh, as a whole uh, slower increases than in the healthy controls. So looking into this in the TBI group in particular, um, one factor that seems to be influencing 
um, whether a participant is showing decreases in volume or just slower increases is age at injury, um, controlling for age at scan. So individuals who were younger uh, at the time of injury um, were more likely to show decreases in cerebellum volume over time, um, as opposed to those who are older, who were still showing increases, just not quite at the same rate as the healthy controls. And now onto the, our exploratory multimodal analyses. So the DTI data, uh, were already processed and published in a prior paper. Um, as I mentioned, these were, um, it was FA averaged across the TBI cess skeleton within JHURLIs. And we ran this analysis both cross-sectionally and longitudinally. So cross-sectionally, we were looking for correlations um, between total cerebellum volume and FA across those various JHURLIs within the TBI group. And we had 252 participants who had uh, cerebellum volume and FA at the same time that passed quality control. For this, we covaried for age, sex, intracranial volume, and injury severity. And for our longitudinal analyses, um, we examined whether there were correlations between FA at the first scan uh, for the TBI group. So this would be a scan that was within six months of injury and change in total cerebellum volume between the first and the second scan. So this sample gets uh, even smaller. So this is why we call this exploratory um, because participants had to have uh, high quality FA, uh, high quality DTI data at time one and high quality um, cerebellar segmentations at time one and time two. And all of the, um, we had some participants who didn't have GCS scores, for example. So this brings us down to 32. Um, which is still fairly large in the world of pediatric TBI neuroimaging, um, but certainly um, small enough that we want to follow this up with more analyses. So for this, we covaried for inter interval between scans, the time since injury of the first scan, uh, injury severity, and percent change in ICV. So looking at um, uh, general atrophy effects. We also ran these correlations in the control group to see what was just the expected pattern uh, of correlations and whether this was an injury dependent association. And what we see here is in the TBI group, um, significant associations, both cross-sectionally and longitudinally between a number of central white matter tracts and total cerebellum volume. So um, they're, they're fairly similar regions between the cross-sectional and the longitudinal analyses. So these are areas that are uh, at the same time uh, associated with cerebellum volume, but also uh, predictive of changes in cerebellum volume. In the control population, um, the only significant association was with the peduncles, um, which is what we would um, expect to see but that suggests to us that these links here between white matter and cerebellum are injury dependent. And by covariating for injury severity and for change in um, intracranial volume, um, and we can say that these are not simply linked by severity or atrophy, that you would expect that someone who had um, a worse, worse F, lower FA, worse white matter organization might also, just by virtue of having a more severe injury, have more changes in the cerebellum but these associations go beyond that. So to summarize what we found, we see significantly smaller uh, cerebellum volumes in the traumatic brain injury working group, uh, excuse me, in the traumatic brain injury um, participant group. Um, these were primarily in the posterior cerebellum. So um, some thoughts about why that might be the case. Um, one possibility is that the posterior cerebellum is more vulnerable because of immaturity that it's one of the later regions to, uh, to mature and uh, with age at peak of, of adolescence and early adulthood, and most of our participants were adolescent. So um, it's reasonable to assume that most of them had uh, cerebellum, cerebellum that were still maturing, that were still developing. So it's possible that because these brain regions were still undergoing changes and still responding to the environment, that they're just vulnerable to these inputs. Um, it's also possible that this posterior cerebellum is just more vulnerable in general. And one point supporting this is that there are uh, two other Enigma analyses looking at these Acapulco measures uh, 
um, in adults that are currently under review. And um, looking at PTSD and epilepsy, these two conditions both also show um, effects primarily in the posterior cerebellum. So it might be that it's just uh, a particularly vulnerable area due to connectivity or, um, or cell types. Um, and of course, both of these things could be true. It might not be mutually exclusive. We also see that these effects appear to emerge at a later post-injury period. So this suggests to us that the cerebellum is vulnerable to secondary injury rather than primary injury. And it is associated with executive function. So there are actual functional consequences for these changes, for these alterations that we're seeing. Um, going back to the indirect uh, secondary injury hypothesis, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, there's support for this in the animal literature. And there's theoretical support for this uh, in knowing that the cerebellum has many structural and functional connections with the cerebrum. The white matter is particularly vulnerable to disruption in traumatic brain injury, especially in more severe injuries, um, diffuse axonal injury or traumatic axonal injury. Uh, it occurs uh, when the brain is experiencing the forces and the axons are, are stretched um, in some cases broken, but even being stretched can disrupt the signaling. Um, so this is a common finding in TBI. So it's possible that this, uh, this source of vulnerability is, uh, is propagated to the cerebellum. Um, so one term for this, uh, for this idea is connectomal diastasis, which is where disruption in the cerebrum may propagate to the cerebellum through structural and functional links. Um, one piece uh, in support of this indirect uh, connect connectomal vulnerability um, is that the region that had the largest effect size was the corpus medullare. This is the location of deep nuclei, which send their projections to the cortex. Um, and I'll bring this image back up where you can see these, um, see here, deep nuclei uh, projecting um, through several areas up to multiple areas of the cortex. So um, in addition, our exploratory analysis that incorporated DTI um, also supports the hypothesis that disruption in the white matter tracts is linked with uh, later cerebellar atrophy. And this was uh, again, above and beyond just general injury effects and general atrophy, atrophy effects. Couple of limitations, um, broad variability across our cohorts in, um, in design. This is something that all Enigma analyses face. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot of uh, questions that we can answer with, with greater power with the Enigma approach, but there's uh, a lot of caveats. There's um, a lot of detail that we can't get into. And um, we really, for many reasons, do consider this to be a hypothesis generating approach where other uh, other investigators can look in more detail in their own individual cohorts to take what we find and, and move it out further along. Um, so we try to account for this variability when we can, but of course we can't account for all uh, sources of variability. We also can um, fully uh, account for premorbid factors. So premorbid psychiatric, behavioral, and neurological factors could all be at play here. Um, all of these uh, cohorts had a list of exclusion criteria that included um, various um, psychiatric, behavioral, and neurological conditions, um, but there might be uh, some that were not included as well, that could be at play here. And TBSS is an atlas-based approach, not a tract-based approach. So in the future, um, tractography of the cerebellar tracts would be helpful in um, furthering this idea of transmission of, of vulnerability. And lesion mapping. So this was one of our earlier hypotheses was that uh, the that lesions in the frontal cortex might be linked with um, cerebellar atrophy. Um, and the question that we'd be trying to address here, um, what we'll do in the future, is if there is an injury epicenter that is particularly linked with cerebellum disruption. Um, frontal and temporal lesions are most common in TBI. So we would like to see in the future if lesions here are associated with later cerebellum disruption. Um, however, it's entirely possible that, that these are not correlated, that it's just the, uh, the, the alterations we see in the cerebellum 
are more dependent on white matter vulnerability on traumatic axonal injury than on gross lesions. And with that, I would like to thank um, everybody who is involved with this, who shared data, who shared time and ideas, um, and the research assistants who went through and QC'd all of those uh, segmentations for us. And I will stop there and take any questions. Uh, th thanks, Emily, uh, for such a great talk. Uh, this is quite an undertaking <laughs> uh, to consolidate all these data sets, analyze, and so on. So I have a few questions, but but if the audience has any questions, please unmute yourself and ask. <clears throat> so so I'll, I'll just get started with a question. Uh, I was so for mild TBI, and I, I, maybe there's some gradation there. Like how how mild is mild? Uh, is there some thinking on reversibility? So so brain plasticity, where where the the changes you see either in cerebellum, they, they could be somehow reversible. And, and is there some kind of an evidence in, in these large data sets? Did you see even when, for example, when when kids are getting better, maybe in some other symptoms, do you see any reversible changes? Yeah, I think that's um, in general entirely possible. And that's one of the, the things that we particularly think about in pediatric injury because of the plasticity um, and that it's a double-edged sword, that it can be a source of vulnerability, but also hopefully a, a mechanism for recovery. Um, and I think our um, what we showed here and what we've shown in prior studies as well is that the, there do seem to be a, uh, there does seem to be a divergence where some kids um, will get better over time and some continue to get worse. Um, at least here, it appeared that the age at injury was associated with that. But in terms of whether there might be um, some sort of intervention that could reverse these changes. Uh, we, I, I think that that would be great to look at if you could take advantage of the connection and it's first the source of vulnerability, but then also, um, propagation of recovery. Um, but that would, that would certainly be a, a future analysis that, that someone with a lot of, um, information on the rehabilitation of their patients could, could look into here. Cool. Maybe you have a question on chat. Uh, so, so Emily, if you want to read, read oh, it. Yes. <laughs> Um, with parcelating cerebellum, what were the most common cerebellar regions requiring manual correction? Um, yeah, so we actually didn't do much manual correction. What we did, uh, for, for most of this was we would just exclude that region for that subject, um, and include them in the other regional analyses. Um, we did do some correction with the longitudinal analysis just because we did not want to lose anybody that we could possibly save. Um, for this, uh, the only thing I did, though, was uh, corrected over um, estimations. Um, I, I did not want to get into the uh, trying to trying to fill in missing tissue, um, not knowing where the actual boundaries were supposed to be. Um, but the areas that seem to fail the most for 8A, 8B, and 7. Um, and we found this as well in a, in a military sample, that those were the regions uh, in a very, the, the large limbic sensi study, that those were the regions that failed the most. Um, Chris uh, 2 also showed, uh, uh, Chris 1, excuse me, also showed some, um, uh, some underestimations. Um, and uh, I, I don't, I think a lot of those were actually just because one of our cohorts um, had a higher fail rate. So when we removed them from the analysis, that that wasn't a uh, didn't look like a particularly vulnerable area. So seven, eight A, and eight B. Uh, uh, did you talk about DTI harmonization? Uh, maybe I missed that. Uh, no, I didn't. Um, and for us, we uh, we didn't do harmonization with a capital H. Um, we used a uh, a streamlined processing pipeline, so they were all processed the same way. Um, but we um, th they of course had a variety in terms of their acquisition parameters. And for this, we did not use any sort of combat harmonization of the DTI measures. 
we um, simply used sight as a, as a random effect to try to account for some of the differences in parameters. But that's another thing that we're looking into for the future. Future, yeah. So, uh, so besides combat, which is like a statistical level harmonization, you also know about uh, the raw DDI scans. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and are you uh, for Enigma in general? Are, are you looking into those things? We haven't for Enigma, um, but we are actually working with um, with the group at Harvard who's been working on the raw DDI yeah. yeah, with right. Yogesh. Um, for our Olympic Sensi study, um, because um, I, some of our some of our cohorts are, you know, fairly small, and when you get down to maybe only um, a couple dozen subjects at one cohort and in one site versus another, um, you start to wonder whether uh, whether you can really <laughs> trust it. But with the Olympic Sensi project, we have anywhere between one and 300 subjects across eight different sites. So I think it's a much better, at least first pass for, um, for testing out that, that raw DTI harmonization. Cool. Well, uh, and any more questions? So, 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 so in your longitude, yeah. Uh, Artemis, did you have any? Hey, Artemis. Hey, Emily, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I was wondering, I know with the stroke group, we always saw a lot of cerebellar lesions. Is there a world where you would see a cerebellar lesion with a TBI? Or is that just like too yeah. crazy? Yeah, well, no, we do see some. Yeah, we do see some. They generally were fairly small, um, but we did go through every single one and um, and characterize those. I think we'll be able to do that in um, in with better accuracy um, soon when we finish our lesion segmentation pipeline, um, and then we can go back go back to this and make sure that that we we caught them. Yeah, that would be super interesting. <laughs> in in your statistical analysis, you mentioned uh, covariating for the interval. What what is that? Uh, is that, yeah for the longitudinal like analysis? Yes. Yeah, that was um, covariating for the interval between scans um, because yes. some of our sites, their first scan was at three months, and their second one was at eighteen months, and some maybe there was only seven months between um, between scans. So, so the thing. difference, the difference between the scans. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, inter and, and did that make a difference? Uh, because you're also trying to think about. Logic yeah. analysis for some of our data, and, and that's yeah. kind of an interesting thing too. Yeah, I think it it definitely it definitely did because there was so much variability. And if you have someone who scanned three months apart, you're you wouldn't expect to see nearly the same level of changes. Mm -hmm. and, and and so when when you were pooling all the scans, uh, you, you at one point of time you had seven hundred or so scans. Uh, yeah. But in, in your analysis, you you looked at them separately. So cross-sectional, you you didn't add all, all, all the scans in there. So maybe like the first time point or, or the second time point. Or yeah, how actually for our first, for our primary analysis, we included all 783, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and because we had some people who had longitudinal data, we just mm -hmm. included subject as a, as a random effect so that we could okay. try to include all of it, but also... Um, tr trying to get at the question of whether this is a general effect or if it's primarily driven by um, one particular time po point post-injury. And most of our data was actually, the largest portion of our data was in the chronic phase. So um, it turned out that it was significant overall, but it was mostly driven by uh, the chronic phase. Mm -hmm. But we did see it in the overall analysis. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Uh Yeah, any any more questions? Uh, so so then let's and and Emily uh, maybe stay for a few minutes. Uh, we can chat uh, after the talk. And and so let's thank Emily again uh, for this talk. And and uh, the seminar's over. Uh, see you next month. Thanks, everyone.